Hello and welcome to Get Britain Out's second podcast of the series. This week we'll be speaking to Daniel Kaczynski. Daniel is MP for Shrewsbury and Etcham, a Leave constituency and a Leave a Brexiteer MP. Um, so I thought we'd dive straight in and talk about yesterday and Theresa May's paragraph from Dominic Raab and how she's now stated that she's officially taken over negotiations. Do you think that unofficially this had been going on for a long time or do you think only now is that Theresa May's taken over? Well, I think the um, the problem with I have I have with the whole process is that we are um, not just doing this for ourselves, but we're doing this for hundreds of millions of people on the continent of Europe who, like us, have severe reservations about the European Union, about the direction of travel of this entity, the lack of transparency and accountability, the fact that its accounts have been signed off for 23 years in a row, the fact that it's moving towards create the creation of a supranational structure with one foreign policy, one parliament, one president, and one EU army. And we are the first to attempt to pull away. It's extremely difficult process for us. There are no roadmaps to follow. Um, and yet we seem to be doing, in my view, giving far too many concessions to the European Union, because it looks as if the European Union is very much winning in the stakes of a sovereign European country versus the European Union. Uh, we are increasingly being led to believe that the days of genuine sovereignty for any European country are almost at an end, and the supremacy of the European Union and the European Commission are of such magnitude that any sovereign nation can only have a compromise at best, and at worst, a neutered version of sovereignty because um, they don't want this to happen. You talked about how the EU are getting the better of us in these negotiations. Is that because of Theresa May the person, or is it because of how Parliament is constituted that she's struggling domestically to then put something tangible to the EU? What's going on there? Well, a very, very toxic combination uh, of circumstances have uh, been created, which uh, are making uh, the Brexit that you and I voted for increasingly difficult. Uh, she called a general election unnecessarily. We asked her not to call a general election. We believed, we believed, and still believe, we had a mandate that, that general election was unnecessary. It created um, a circumstance where no party had a majority in the House of Commons, and so these tiny, tiny voices, both in the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, to a certain degree, are given such extraordinary power to thwart what you and I believe is Brexit. When I went to the polling station, I felt that by putting the cross next to Brexit, my understanding was that we were pulling out of all of the structures of the European Union, that we, we were regaining our sovereignty as a, as a country, and that on the 31st of March uh, 2019, we would be a sovereign nation. And then from that status, we would negotiate our new relationship with the European Union. It seems that there are many people who, uh, in, in the House of Commons, um, minorities though they are, but numerous in number, um, who want to prevent that from happening, who give us um, Operation Fair all over again, uh, but this time augmented a thousandfold we're too small uh, to, to be sovereign. We need to continue to have a legal framework with the European Union. Our WTO is a cliff edge. Uh, they will use all of these perceptions and scare stories to try to frighten people uh, into ensuring that we continue to be a vassal state to the European Union. That is deeply troubling for me because I believe in democracy. And I believe that uh, we should respect the wishes of the British people who voted in unprecedented numbers to, uh, to reject the European Union. It's interesting what you said about how people say the terminology, terminology of crashing out if we don't get a deal now. And if we go on 
WTA rules, as you said, again, it's Project Fear rehashed. In your opinion, and I, you probably reflect the ERG in some way and the general um, ideas that they, they're looking for, what is, what is the argument for going back on WTA rules if we don't get the deal that we voted for? Well, look, um, I think it's a question of confidence uh, in one's nation. Um, I came to this country as a foreigner in 1978, but over the last uh, three, four decades, I have grown to grown to have a huge amount of confidence in this country and what it stands for, its position in the world. Um, how has this tiny island managed to export it, its law, its language, its judicial processes? around the world? Why is it that the British brand is so strong? Why is it that so many people want to buy British, want to trade with Britain, want to cooperate with Britain? This is a unique country. And I think that there are many people, unfortunately, who don't have that confidence in our country, believe that uh, we can't somehow survive um, trading on WTO TO terms with the European Union, and that we have to make compromises. I don't believe that compromises should be made. We should be standing up uh, and saying we are, we voted for independence, we will become an independent nation and then from that independent nation status we can on an ongoing basis continue to negotiate with you uh, for a meaningful relationship. Don't forget we have a trade deficit with them of 81 billion pounds a year. If we went to WTO terms our companies would have to pay them £5 billion in customs duties. Their companies would have to pay us £12 billion. So there's a massive extra income for the Exchequer already. We trade with America, our single biggest uh, uh, customer on WTO terms. We trade with many other countries on WTO terms. So I don't think it's something that we should fear. Um, I remember 1999, uh, December 99, when they promised us Armageddon because of the millennia, planes would fall out of the sky. Um, I, I remember we were promised that if we dared to vote for Brexit, unemployment would go up by 800,000, that the economy would crash. The economy is growing at 1.6%, at 1.4% this year. It's predicted next year to grow by 1.6%. It's a question of, do you have confidence in this country and do you believe in this country's sovereignty, or don't you? I believe in this country, and I believe that her best days are ahead of her. And it really depresses me, and, and I won't mention them by names, but I'm sure you know who they are. It really depresses me that a small amount, number of Tory MPs, can basically hold a gun uh, to our heads, take advantage of the arithmetic, that has happened as a result of the election and try to prevent, do their level-headed best to try to prevent the sort of Brexit that you and I expect. I want to push you on that point of um, a democracy, especially in this country, and the cynicism you said, because it seems to me that there's a real potential now for a disillusionment in politics if the Brexit that 17.4 million people voted for doesn't occur and we are effectively leaving in, in name only, if that happens, it seems to me that the Conservative Party will be tainted at the next election significantly. And we saw what happened in 2017 with Brexit on their backs. It seems like a Jeremy Corbyn government is almost a shoe in Well, I would be devastated <clears throat> by a Jeremy Corbyn government. And I think the damage that that man would wreak on our, on our country would be incalculable. Um, I mean, he is the most left-wing leader of the Labour Party, certainly in the course of my lifetime. And I'm old enough to remember the militant trade unions of the late 1970s and what happened to our country then when we had nationalisation, uh, when you had things like British Airways, British Telecom, everything was nationalised. Nothing, you're too young to remember this, and, and of course nothing happened in our country without the say of the trade unions who controlled everything in the state enterprises and we were falling behind, um, we were an economic basket case. So, of course, we want to prevent that from happening. But what I would say is, is very important is that um, we, are playing, we are playing a game of Russian roulette here, and the stakes couldn't be higher. If the British people 
at the end of this whole process, in uh, the end of March of 2019, if they believe and they will be influenced by people like you and the media and the Sun and the Telegraph and the BBC, God help us, and, and other organizations, the media will play a huge role in helping them to decide but if they come to the conclusion that somehow they've been sold a pup, and somehow this has this has been a Brexit in everything, a non a fictitious Brexit has been uh, um, implemented, then I think the backlash will be spectacular, and then I think all bets are off. This is why we are getting so agitated. This is why. Um, the ERG is playing a very important role. I know that there are people who call us um, swivel-eyed extremists and that uh, we are obsessed with sovereignty and constitution. Well, of course, there needs to be a group of people in our society who are obsessed and focused. 17.4 million people on, are. On issues to do with sovereignty and constitution. The business community have very effectively and very vocally um, CBI is the embodiment, and by the way, the CBI, as you know, is partly financed by the European Union. But the CBI and many business um, entities want a Brexit, which is purely focused on trade and purely focused on minimizing disruption to their uh, exports and their sales procedures. They want continuity. They want continuity. Fair enough. Fair play to them, they should make their representations. But the decision shouldn't just be based on what the business community wants or what the CBI wants. I was talking to a very a former soldier yesterday um, who served in Northern Ireland, who's now set up one of the most successful um, international engineering companies. And he exports 89% uh, of all of his equipment uh, is exported abroad. 15% uh, goes to the European Union. 20% uh, goes to America. And he's, he said to me, listen, we will adapt and change. We're, we're already doing this with America. We're, we're doing these um, filling in forms and, and having to pay duties and whatever. The customers realize and understand that. We're doing that very successfully with America. We will adapt and change to the new circumstances. He's willing to make those changes, but it would appear, it would appear many other British businesses want to somehow compromise on our sovereignty, compromise on our independence, purely to avoid the short-term short -term potential disruption uh, to their logistical uh, pr procedures. But there's much more something much more important at stake here. Britain's reputation globally and her ability to make decisions for herself. There's nothing more important than that. Nothing more important than that. I think we'll end there on that positive note. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.